So it is Alberto Salazar in front. Dick Beardsley in the hat behind. As Alberto Salazar comes up around Ring Road, will make the turn down Ring Road toward the Prudential Center. Alberto Salazar in only his third marathon. But watch Beardsley. Beardsley is making a move. It has come down to this. Beardsley and Salazar. The motorcycle's got to get out of the way. Here comes Beardsley. He's got to make a move on Salazar. Salazar looks behind him. It is neck and neck. One of the closest finish ever. Beardsley on the left. There's Salazar. Beardsley, can he have enough? Salazar kicking. Pushing off the final challenge by Dick Beardsley to win the 1982 Boston Marathon. Let's watch it as it finishes. Extremely gutty Dick Beardsley finishing right behind. Unofficial winning time, 208.53, a new Boston record. A bit shy of Salazar's own world record set in the New York Marathon. Salazar and Beardsley, arm in arm. What a great race they ran down through Heartbreak Hill and to this finish line. Good morning. Welcome to everyone here. This is an honor for me. I used to watch this young man run on TV <laughs> when I was growing up. Um, we're somewhat the same age. He's a little bit younger. You have to talk in Oh, I'm sorry. A little bit younger than, than what I am. But it was wonderful because this is, I never knew he was a YZ grad. He's got friends here that are, have come a long way. He's got a fourth grade teacher here that is here. I'm sure my fourth grade teacher wouldn't be here if I was being <laughs> inducted. I kind of gave her a little run around and I'm not sure that would happen. But welcome to the students, welcome to former staff that's here, welcome to current administration that's here. Um, some school board members are here as well and we're here to honor Dick Beardsley as our distinguished alumni for the year 2011. And congratulations to you Dick and your wife Jill and we're glad to have you inducted into that esteemed group that's out on the wall out here. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John, and he has a, a speech of about 20 minutes, yeah. I think. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Perseverant, courageous, and inspiring are just some of the qualities uh, that Mr. Dick Beardsley and his incredible story display. These qualities resonated with the student council when deciding this year's Wyzetta High School's distinguished alumni. Since 1990, the Wyzetta High School Student Council has honored alumni who have gone on to do great things for their community, nation, and globe. As a council, we review numerous nominations for the Distinguished Alumni Award. Students of the Student Council Senate are given information on each nomination and are to come ready to honor and nominate a nomination for the award the following week. We then vote on the recipient of the award. As a council, we had, uh, and uh, no, I'm sorry, as an author and renowned motivational speaker, the student council had no difficulty in choosing this year's distinguished alumni. The hardships Mr. Beardsley has overcome are endless. Just to name a few, he has been entangled in an auger, been in a car accident, been hit by a truck, rolled his car, fallen off a cliff, and become addicted to painkillers. Now, for most people, their life would be in shambles. But that's what sets Dick Beardsley apart. He has overcome numerous surgeries, hospital visits, and days of rehab, and still lives his life to the fullest every day. Even with a complete knee replacement, Dick still runs, bikes, and swims. Currently, Mr. Beardsley is a motivational speaker who tours the nation, speaking to corporations and schools. He also runs camps for high schoolers, and just four years ago, the Dick Beardsley Foundation 
was established in an effort to help individuals with chemical dependency. Dick travels the country to speak to and educate children about living an active lifestyle and being chemical free. His accomplishments and history is truly remarkable. On behalf of the 2011-2000 Student Council and the faculty and students of the Wyzetta Public Schools, I would like to congratulate Mr. Dick Beardsley as the Wyzetta High School's 25th Distinguished Alumni. It is now my pleasure to uh, turn it over to Connie Lewis, who has a short presentation on Mr. Beardsley. I just heard Sue Jewell say Connie's never had a short presentation in her life. And when you're talking about Dick Beardsley, it is really hard to pick which of the amazing stories to tell about him. And because of that, once you've had the opportunity to hear Dick talk today, you will want to know more about him. So I'm starting out with a commercial. Your program insert gives kind of an overview of Dick's life. And the, uh, the book that Dick wrote, Staying the Course, gives an overview of his life, the ups and downs and various um, trails that he took and trials that he went through in his journey ultimately to be here today. Um, you can also check the Dick Beardsley Foundation website, dickbeardsleyfoundation.org, and at that place you will be able to find short videos, including the well-known finish to the 1982 Boston Marathon. And here again is the white cap of Dick Beardsley, number three from Minnesota. Um, there are links to Dick's Facebook pages, and um, also the book that John Brandt wrote, Duel in the Sun, relates the experiences and stories of both Dick and Alberto Salazar. The similarities and differences in their life stories, their fierce competition at the 1982 Boston Marathon, and stories of what happened to them in the following years. It culminates with a story of the two of them coming together when Dick came to run the Dick Beardsley Half Marathon. In addition, anytime you ever have the opportunity to hear Dick speak, be there. Be on time, be early. He might be late, but, um, <laughs> but he'll get there, and he'll have great stories. Dick grew up in the Plymouth area in the late 60s and early 70s, and we were much more rural in those days. Dick spent a lot of time outdoors. He did a lot of fishing and was successful enough that he had his own guiding business, earning the nickname Walleye Beardsley. Dick's parents were typical city folk, but somehow Dick developed a passion for dairy farming. There were quite a few hobby farms in the area, and Dick would help with milking cows and doing other chores so he could learn as much as possible in order to pursue a career in dairy farming. When he got to high school, he had another goal, to get a date. He noticed that the guys with letter jackets were the ones with girlfriends, so he decided he needed to earn a letter. At that time, Dick was six feet tall, he weighed 130 pounds, he picked football. It took him a while to figure out how to put on all the gear. He went out to practice, and all of a sudden he was tackled by about 20 guys. He was on the bottom, pulled himself up, turned his football equipment in, and decided that he would be a bachelor dairy farmer at that point. <laughs> his friend George Ross, who couldn't make it here today, suggested to Dick that he join the cross-country team. Dick had no idea what cross-country involved, and George said, ah, oh, Dick, it's fun. We run through the woods and the swamps and the fields, you just run. Dick already spent a lot of time outdoors, so he thought that that was a great plan. The next day, Dick was the first person to practice. One time only, probably. Um, he sat there in his rusted old dots and pickup, dressed in what he thought was okay running gear. With sights on earning a letter, he was ready to go. Dick's nothing but enthusiastic. When Dick saw the other guys show up, they had shiny sweats on, multicolored shoes, he dove for the floor of his pickup to hide. He wasn't going to continue this sport either. However, the guys were on to him. They pulled him out of the truck, they took a look at Dick, and they howled with laughter. Dick hadn't been able to find his white gym shorts that morning, but he did find a pair of white shorts that belonged to his dad. His dad weighs 200 pounds. He held up those white shorts with a black belt. Dick's description is that had he been dropped from an airplane in a good wind, 
he would have looked like Mary Poppins <laughs> floating down to earth. Mary Poppins in blue bumper tennis shoes and a pair of his dad's black socks that came up to his knees. Gales of laughter subsided long enough for the coach to tell them to run around the block. That sounded like an easy workout, so Dick ran with the guys. However, it wasn't just around the block. The guys kept running. In the past, the longest Dick had ever run was from one end of the basketball court to the other. The workout proved to be a challenge, and Dick ended up walking about the last mile. However, he was ecstatic. This was going to be his sport. Exhausted and energized, Dick got home and couldn't shut up talking about his great day. His mom took him shopping, and he got new red leather Adidas running shoes. And the next day, he got a uniform, a bright blue t-shirt with Wyzetta cross country and gold letters, and bright blue shorts with gold stripes. In that uniform, he was a new person. And this was the start of Dick's journey in the world of running. Eventually, Dick was picked to run varsity and finished as the fifth runner, which counts in scoring. Dick felt great. He was going to get a letter jacket. With newfound courage, he asked a girl to homecoming, a cheerleader. She said yes. Now, if you want to find out how he practiced kissing girls in order to be ready for that, you're going to have to ask Dick. <laughs> Put him on the spot, make him tell the story. Dick and George became even closer friends. George's parents, Joe and Carol Ross, were Dick's godparents. Joe, rest his soul, loved nothing better than working with and encouraging runners. It was because of Joe that Dick associated running with fun. Joe was always there for Dick. If the wind was blowing 30 miles an hour in January when it was 20 below, Joe would drive Dick out 10 or 15 miles so Dick could run back with the wind at his back. Carol, who is here today sitting over there, um, always made sure there was a place at the dinner table for Dick. Then there were the famous cross-country donut runs. Joe would have the kids out running, and Carol would make huge piles of homemade donuts for everybody. The Ross family had a profound impact on Dick, and he became a member of the family. And Dick, I imagine you can still hear the voice of Joe Ross yelling, Dickie, you can do it, or I knew you could do it. There are so many stories that Dick can tell of what he learned about running, and training through his experiences. He made mistakes and he made good decisions about training. What has been consistent is his overwhelming love of running. He often says about running, I can fly. The further Dick gets in a race, the stronger he becomes. He loves long races and he can set a pace and work with it. My next story is about Dick Center on shoes. You've already heard about his blue bumper tennis shoes from high school. Another story is when he was getting ready for a second marathon. He ran his first marathon in Wisconsin on a whim and didn't train for it. Two months later, he learned about the City of Lakes Marathon and decided to participate. This was Tuesday. The race was Sunday. The day before the race, he went to a running store, tried on a pair of Nike waffle trainers, walked around the store a bit, and said he'd take the shoes. Then he put them back in the box. Guy asked if he didn't want to wear them a bit to break them in. And Dick told him, I'm running in a marathon tomorrow. I don't want to get them dirty. <laughs> the next day, about eight or nine miles into the marathon, Dick's feet started aching, and he was surprised. He would never had a problem with blisters. He looked down at his new shoes and saw they were blood-soaked because his feet were bleeding that much. Eventually, his feet went numb, and he felt pretty good. He crossed the finish line and collapsed. He finished seventh and earned a trophy. Another shoe story. Dick was running a lot of races, but he knew that in order to achieve the next step, he would need a coach, and he really needed a shoe contract. He heard about a sporting goods show at the Radisson South Hotel, so he made up a resume to give to the reps. He headed to the convention, but was stopped by a big security guy who told Dick he couldn't get in without an official button. He had to have his name on it, and this show was only open to buyers. Dick tried to talk his way in, but the answer was always an emphatic no. He became creative and walked all around the building to try to get in. Finally, there was a door open. Dick was psyched. However, the security guard was at that door also and bounced Dick out again. This time he was told that if it happened again, the security guy was going to call the cops. Dejected, Dick returned to his car, turned, and took one last look at the hotel. There, coming out of the hotel, was a man with a shiny button on his lapel. 
Dick was wearing ratty old tennis shoes with holes in them, but he knew he could run up, grab the button, and be gone before the man realized what happened. However, a man of integrity, Dick humbly walked up, introduced himself, told his story, and offered the man the final $2 he had left in his pocket. The man refused, said he would not sell his button. However, he admired what Dick was doing and gave him the button. The security guard was ready for Dick, ready to bounce him out. Dick had covered up the buttons with his resumes, and then as the guy was about to grab him, pulled the resumes down and walked into the convention. At each of the booths, Dick introduced himself and gave a resume. The reps were dismissive, and as Dick walked away, they would drop his resume in the trash. Eventually, he had one resume left, and there were two reps he hadn't approached. Dick settled on New Balance, smiled, walked up, handed the rep his resume. This time, the gentleman looked at the resume and was impressed with the fact that at each resume Dick ran, his time improved. He then asked Dick, what size shoes do you wear? Dick was so excited, he was ready to fit his feet into any size shoes that the man had available. <laughs> the man handed Dick a pair of New Balance 620s in his size. At that time, those were the best shoes in the world. He told Dick to put them on and try them out. Dick ran up and down the aisles, came back, put the shoes in the box, and said they were the nicest shoes he had ever had on his feet, but he couldn't afford them. The rep told me he didn't intend to sell them to Dick. He was giving them to Dick. He also said that when he returned to Boston, he would send Dick some more shoes and hook him up with the New Balance Track Club. That was the beginning of an important relationship. When Dick was training in Atlanta for the Boston Marathon, he would go for a walk as part of his training. One day, he found a round, flat rock with a piece missing, so it was in the shape of a V, V for victory. He tucked the rock back where no one could see it, and every night on his walk, he would stop and put the toe of his right shoe in the V, V for victory. It became a ritual that helped him believe that the Boston Marathon would be his best ever. I'm only going to talk about the shoes in regard to the 1982 Boston Marathon. In order to get the whole story, you need to watch video of the race, read about it, or hear Dick talk about the marathon. It was incredibly intense and powerful and the most memorable marathon ever. Dick came in second to Alberto Salazar, and this is the only race in which someone has gained notoriety by coming in second. Following the marathon, the presses were interviewing Dick, and Dick's feet were killing him, so he took his shoes off. He had promised those shoes to Coach Squires to donate to the Catholic Church for a fundraiser, so they did have value. When the questions were done, Dick reached for his shoes, and they were gone. He thought maybe Mary, to whom he was married at the time, had taken them to his room, so he hobbled back to the hotel in stocking feet. When Dick was soaking in the tub, the phone rang, and Mary answered. Is this Dick Beardsley's room? Mary said, yes. Tell him he ran a great race. And tell him I'm the guy that stole his shoes and I don't plan to return them. And the man hung up. The shoes were gone. If any of you hears anything about the Dick Beardsley shoes, <laughs> tell the person to return them to Dick, no questions asked. The Against the Wind 5K virtual race will be held March 12th, 2012. And in a perfect world, Dick and his shoes will be re reunited by that time. Runners are superstitious, and they have rituals, and they look for signs. Beyond a certain amount of training, the race is mental, and runners need to develop ways to convince their brain to keep the rest of their body fired up. When Dick was running to Duluth to run Grandma's Marathon in 1981, he was not his usual Mr. Positive to the point of oblivion, and he began to be filled with doubt and needed to rid himself of that second guessing that was going on in his mind. His mail was lying on the seat beside him and he flipped a magazine open. There was a headline about John Graham of England who won the Rotterdam Marathon in a time of 209, one of the top times in the world. Then Dick noticed the mile marker on the highway. It was 209. He started to think about running grandmas in 209. When he got to the hotel and got his room key, it was for 902, 209 backwards. There was no doubt in his mind that he would run 209 the next day. 
One of Dick's rituals for marathons was to wear the same warm-ups, same racing shoes, same everything for each race. However, for this marathon, New Balance had new gear they wanted him to wear. Dick did bring his old gear as a spare. They'd been through a lot together. On the night before races, Dick would have nightmares that he would not have the right shoes, he would have to borrow something from another racer, or there would be some other crisis. To deal with that, he and Mary would get a room with two beds. The two of them would sleep in one bed, and his racing outfit slept in the other. <laughs> he would pin his number on the singlet and place it on the bed, put his shorts below the singlet, then the socks and the shoes. His racing stuff was gonna, going to get a good rest if he couldn't. Dick put his gear to bed, and the next day he put them on, ready to race. As he and Mary were leaving the room, Dick thought about his old uniform stuffed in the duffel bed in the closet, duffel bag in the closet, and he knew he couldn't leave a good friend alone in the bag. He sent Mary ahead and returned to the room. He took a hanger and lovingly hung the singlet on it, found safety pins and pinned the, short, pinned the shorts to the singlet and the socks to the shorts. Then he tied his old racing shoes to the socks. The hotel looked out on the 25 mile mark. So Dick hung the outfit in the window and thought, by golly, my old buddy isn't gonna run with me, but he can still watch as I go by. <laughs> At about the 22 mile point in the race, Dick had a pretty good lead over Gary Bjorklund, the defending champion. But that's a tough spot in any marathon. Dick heard his name and looked up. There was Joe Ross in street shoes, wearing long pants, running beside him, hollering, Dick, Dick, you're doing great, keep it up. Dick was struggling to maintain his pace and was hurting. Joe's encouragement came at just the right time. Then as Dick came to the corner where he had to take a left by the Radisson, he had a terrible cramp. He looked up and there was his outfit hanging in the window. Seeing his old buddy gave him a boost of confidence and Dick forged on. As he neared the finish line, he could see the big clock and it read 2.09.04. He assumed the race officials had forgotten to start it on time as he didn't think he was running that fast. The crowd was going wild. Dick crossed the finish line leaping for joy and the announcer yelled, Dick Beardsley, our 1981 Grammys Marathon champion. Two hours, nine minutes, 36 seconds. The official time was 209.36.6, so it went into the record books as 209.37, a course record. His coach had sent Dick an envelope with instructions to open it after the race. Dick tore open the envelope and the message from the coach stated, Dickie, I knew you were gonna run 209. Enough about running. I need to tell one more story that describes Dick's courage, resilience, stamina, and optimism. Farm accidents are often deadly. However, Dick's experience with his leg caught in the shaft of the power takeoff is nothing short of miraculous. In Dick's book, he describes the day on the farm that started before 4 a.m. with countless tasks necessary on a dairy farm. When you read his book, you get the excruciating details of what happened when he took a shortcut in restarting the tractor to get the power takeoff moving in order to load the corn with the auger. Dick jumped up on the drawbar, which was icy. As he turned on the ignition, his left leg slipped and his leg began to be wrapped around the rotating shaft. As Dick was whipped around and around, he tried to grab the shutoff lever. Time and again, he was unsuccessful. Dick was losing consciousness, but his fingers finally connected with the, the lever and he was able to stop the machine. He got up and was able to stand, but when he took a step, he collapsed. Dick was able to drag his battered body toward the house where Mary found him. Crazy things happened. When Mary called 911, the person asked if Dick was still caught in the power takeoff. She ran outside to ask Dick and he said, look at me, does it look like I'm still caught in the PTO? No. Mary was so nervous she did run back and say he still was, but. Mr. Optimistic found humor in the situation. He thought Mary's question was hilarious, and at that point, he knew he was going to survive. Although Dick had, well, another thought Dick had was that he was so fortunate that the accident didn't happen in the barn where the floor was concrete, because then he would have had profound injuries or may not have survived. Dick does always look at the bright side. The ambulance got lost coming to the farm when it finally arrived, the EMTs were asking each other what to do. 
although this was rural America, they'd never had a farm accident to deal with before. Dick suffered a punctured lung from broken ribs, a broken right wrist, contusions to his head, and a concussion. He had a couple of broken vertebrae in his back that weren't discovered for five years. His leg was so shattered they didn't know if he would be able to walk again without a cane or a brace. His left knee had all the tendons pulled off the bone and his knee bent sideways. Read Dick's book to get the essence of the agonizing recovery he endured, including an infection that developed in his leg and had it not been dealt with when it was, would have resulted in amputation of his leg. The farm accident was followed by a number of accidents and surgeries. Dick withstood excruciating pain and was given pain meds, which ultimately resulted in addiction. The pain continued and the dependence upon the drugs got stronger. Dick ended up forging prescriptions to keep up the supply of drugs. The day he was caught was a great day. This was a turning point in his life. Withdrawal from the powerful drugs he was taking was agonizing, but Dick maintained his upbeat attitude. One of the counselors told him he wasn't taking his recovery seriously. She said, you act like you're happy all the time. As she got to know Dick, she realized it was not an act. Dick is almost obnoxiously cheerful. <laughs> February 12, 1997 was Dick's first day of sobriety, and each day gets better and better for him. Dick has a passion for helping others deal with addiction and has created the Dick Beardsley Foundation, which has a twofold purpose, educating people about chemical dependency and raising funds to assist those unable to pay for treatment. An incredible speaker with a powerful message, Dick speaks to audiences throughout the country. Dick tells his story, speaking about addiction and recovering to people everywhere and connects with a wide variety of audiences. The feedback is extremely positive and Dick gets rave reviews wherever he goes. Following are some of the many accolades Dick has received. My job was to pick up this guy named Richard Beardsley at the airport. Earlier I told him I would be the guy with a white beard. He said he would be the guy with a brace on his leg carrying a guitar. That began my 24 hour friendship with Dick. How do you make friends in such a short period of time? You haven't met Dick. To say he is energetic is like calling Mount Baker a hill. I was totally impressed with his enthusiasm and curiosity about the area and about me. Dick was to be the keynote speaker at our statewide conference of city managers. From the moment he stepped upon the small stage, he had us almost in a trance-like state. He not only has an inspirational personal story, but he also has superb speaking skills. His dramatic story of life combined with his speaking skills left me thinking that his story in many ways was my story. I believe that everyone in the audience felt the same way. The next morning I took Dick back to the airport. He was off to New York. I felt like I was saying goodbye to an old friend. I would like nothing better than for our paths to cross again. Gary Tomsick, city manager, Blaine Washington. Powerful, motivating, and entertaining. Quite simply, Dick Beardsley is an amazing individual and an outstanding speaker. During his presentation to over 1,000 of our students, he had them laughing, crying, and completely captivated. Dick's energy and passion allow him to connect with the audience. The many challenges he has overcome while running and in life make his message of staying the course very real and meaningful. Dick Beardsley is a unique individual with the ability to impact and make a difference in a person's life. The students and staff appreciated and benefited from his presentation. Marie Allen, Oak Bay High School, Victoria, British Columbia. Dick Beardsley is no country bumpkin from Minnesota. I had no hesitation in suggesting Dick as a motivational speaker to our student, students in the Success Initiative. I was anxious to have him visit our school and knew he would relate to our rural and urban audiences. What I was not prepared for were the emails that arrived the next day. Dick's, best, Dick's visit to the Thames Valley District was described to me as one of the most powerful messages given to our students by a motivational speaker. To capture the hearts and attention of approximately 3,000 teenagers for an hour speaks volumes to Dick's passionate message and his ability to engage an audience. Dick's visit to our school brought a message of the importance of believing in yourself, pursuing dreams, healthy active living, addressing substance abuse, and compassion. 
Dick's life, Dick's life story touches every member of his audience. Chris McCready, Vice Principal, West Elgin Secondary School. Two more. As a school administrator, I've had the pleasure of organizing, meeting, and listening to many motivational speakers, and Dick is at the top of the list. His presence and story are powerful. The students and staff took away his message and transposed it to their own experience and are still motivated by him weeks later. On a follow-up task, students have internalized Dick's message and have described how they deal with tough situations differently. If you ever have the opportunity to meet Dick, Cherish it. Joseph Boudreau, Vice Principal, Chamanius Secondary School. Dick Beardsley was a rival of mine in the 80s, but more important, a friend and perhaps our sport's best known good guy. Everyone in the running community likes Dick. Staying the course makes it clear why Dick is universally admired by runners. He showed his heart in his marathons, but his willpower and courage when he, overcame, when he overcame his drug addiction. Bill Rogers, four-time winner of both the New York City and Boston marathons. Dick has had amazing opportunities because of his passion for running. He has traveled the world, has had fierce competitions, and has met great people. Their shared love of running brought Dick and his lovely wife, Jill, together. Jill is Dick's greatest advocate and foremost supporter. She also has the arduous task of keeping track of Dick's many speaking engagements and his travel arrangements. Living in Austin, Texas, they have blended their families and have added several pets to the family circle. Their house is one of continuous activity. In addition to everything else going on in his life, Dick has gotten back to fishing and is using the walleye beardly talents to fish and encourage others to love the sport. Courage provides the foundation for doing things which are difficult. Dick has shown extraordinary courage throughout his life. He has challenged himself physically through arduous marathon training, as well as in recovery from his many accidents and surgeries. He shows strength and mental stamina in maintaining a positive attitude and the ability to focus on whatever goal he has set for himself. Dick is an advocate for pursuing a healthy and active lifestyle, and he encourages and supports people in their journey to fight addiction. Each day, Dick starts his toughest race, staying sober, and he continues to be a champion. Dick, we, re we admire your integrity, your humility, and your positive spirit. We are in awe of your work ethic, and we are grateful for your commitment to reach out and help others. We are so proud to name you the 2011 Wysetta High School Distinguished Alumni Award recipient. I'm not lost for words, but um, <laughs> wow, I, uh, I'm overwhelmed, to be honest with you. And uh, first off, I'd like to thank the Wysetta High School Student Council for presenting me with this award. I'm very, very honored by it. I, I can't thank you all enough. Uh, so much has changed since I graduated from here back in 1975. Gosh, that'll be 37 years ago coming up in May, uh, it's, I was telling my wife, Jill, that when we came on Highway 55 west of 494 there, when I was a kid growing up here, that was all farmland from here all the way probably to the South Dakota border. And, and uh, <laughs> it was just it's a, a lot different. In fact, I remember as a kid helping them tap the trees right down here in the woods for maple syrup. and. Uh, I remember I shot an eight-point buck a mile from downtown Wayzata. <laughs> you know, I remember my one of my teachers, Jack Osberg, was a science teacher, and I used to have him at the end of the day. I remember in the fall, 
And so he'd give the assignment, and then he loved to hunt and fish, so him and I would sneak out of class and then <laughs> go hunt pheasants right outside the was in a country club there and shoot a few ducks while we're at it too. And um, yeah, it's just it's it's a little bit different now than it than it was. And and maybe that's one of the reasons I haven't been back here. I've, I've never made one of my high school reunions yet. Um, not that I didn't always want to, but you know, I I remember what it was like here and 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 you kids that are live here now, it's it's a lot different, you know. And um, where I used to hunt and fish and trap and stuff, now it's homes, and and the woods have been cut down or the fields have been turned into housing development. So it's just it kind of tugs at my heart a little bit when I come back and see areas where I used to roam free with my dog, and and now. Um, that opportunity is no longer here. But that's, you know, when you're 12 miles from Minneapolis, I guess that's to be expected. But it is, it is wonderful to be back here. And I've heard so many things about this high school. And my gosh, when you come up over that bridge, it's like the Taj Mahal. And <laughs> wow, it's, I'm just, it's that wow factor. And you definitely see it here. But, you know, I got to give a lot of thanks to uh, my first coach I had while I was here at Wysetta High School, um, Coach Gary Riedel. He was an English teacher. And and Coach Riedel, you know, I don't, you know, he'd probably be the first to say back then, he probably didn't know a lot about running, but, you know, for me, he made it really fun. And uh, back then, you know, I know now the Coach Miles gets like 100 kids or better out for the team. You know, we barely had enough to put enough out on, on the, to a race to have a full team to count. But, but he always made it fun, and, and he always encouraged me, even though I wasn't a very good runner in the beginning. And um, that was pretty special and, and and I owe a big favor to to coach Schaefer. Coach Schaefer was my gym teacher at the time and he was also the football coach and he was also the hockey coach and I, I tried to play hockey but I wasn't very good <laughs> and so I was on the JV team and and coach Schaefer my senior year he came to me and he says you know Beards he says you know when you when you're a senior you can no longer be on the JV hockey team <laughs> If you're not good enough to make the varsity, you just can't play. And he says, you know, I see you running during study hall every day down to Highway 55 and back. He says, you know, maybe you ought to think about pursuing your running more. So uh, big thanks to Coach Schaefer, wherever he might be. That, that helped a lot. And my track coach I had, uh, Coach Schuster, you know, everybody called me Walleye except him. He called me Carp. Yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I, you know, when I went off across country, my, my, junior year and then they I, I really liked the sport even though I wasn't that good at it and then they figured I'd be coming out for track and I thought I said you mean running around that little black cinder thing that was a cinder track back then at the old high school that little cinder track in circles eight ten times me running around that thing I said no way that's too boring I said plus that's you know the fishing season starts then so I didn't go out for track my my junior year but then um but the summer of that that summer between my junior and senior year is when, um, when I uh, really fell in love with the, the sport of running. And, um, you know, uh, getting to that, you know, growing up here, um, we had a little bit of a, our family wasn't probably quite so normal. I mean, we had a loving family, but, um, but it was a little dysfunctional, I, I, I guess. And, and um, a big thanks to my sister. <clears throat> Sheila and uh, her husband Rick for coming here today. Must be time for the next class, huh? <laughs> um, and, uh, and my other sister, Mary Ann, um, she couldn't make it today. But she lives in North Carolina. She's a teacher down there. But um, they've been always, always very, very supportive. and. Um, in my endeavors and whatnot. And before I go on a little bit with my running, I, I want to mention um, another teacher that um, when they asked me to send out some invites to friends, and, and so I put some close family friends here that live in the area, and then I said, gosh, if you could find my teacher, Mrs. Nicholson, my fourth grade teacher, And um, she doesn't know it, but until I just told her when I first got here, but she was really special to me. 
in fourth grade. I think it might have been her first year of teaching, and, and um, things at home weren't the best, and I don't know if my mom had talked to her or what, but anyhow, she always, she just kind of took me, it seemed like anyhow, she took me under her wing, and I'll never, I'll never forget those, some of those days when Mrs. Nicholson would get up in front of our class and she would read um, a book called Pippi Longstocking. And uh, she, would be, she would be cackling like a chicken up there, laughing so hard, <laughs> reading this, this. And, and one of our assignments every day, we had like 20 kids or 30 kids in class, was each day uh, one of the kids was picked to bring the weather for that day. And so um, I'd always get up and I'd watch uh, Clancy and Carmen the nurse in the morning on television. It was a kid's show <laughs> before I uh, would go to school and they always gave the weather report. So I'd always, I'd always write it down and I'd bring it with me. And so if one of the kids forgot it, then I would get up and say the weather story. Well, pretty soon it got to the point after a while that, well, heck, Beardsley's going to bring the weather every day anyhow. So <laughs> pretty soon I turned into our weatherman. And, and uh, it's probably the reason why I'm, I'm still such an amateur weather buff today, but, uh, but um, Mrs. Nicholson, thank you so much for, um, for making it. You were a great kid. Thank you, it means a lot. And, um, and I, the other two teachers, I, I think, Connie, where's Connie? Right there. Did you teach home ec? I did. Yeah. I didn't take home ec back then, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably should have. <laughs> But her husband, Jim, I had, was he a history teacher? Jim. Jim. Oh my gosh. Good to see you. All oh, the fish bite. I think I had Jim as a history, as a, as a teacher, but, but Jim and I always got along because he was an avid, avid fisherman. And, uh, you know, we, we never got fishing together, but we always, we, if we ever did, we always said that the other would always outfish the other. But um, great to see you. Thanks for coming in. And one of the teachers that, that I, uh, I wanted, every student in Wayzata High School wanted her. And um, I think, Sheila, did you get her? Mrs. Jewell? Yes. And Mary Ann did too, I think. And I was, for some reason, I didn't get Mrs. Jewell. Um, but, uh, you know, she was, she was a teacher, honestly. Every student in Wayzata High School wanted to have her as a teacher. And even though she wasn't, um, I didn't get to have her as a teacher, she's been just a huge, huge support, supporter of mine. Um, she came to all of our cross country meets and um, always cheered us on. And then after I got out of high school, she always kept in touch and, and, and followed my running. And um, she's a jewel of a jewel. Thank you, Sue. Appreciate that. Um, and then growing up, you know, I, there were two families that I was really, really close with and, um, and still very close to today. As a kid, I was in 4-H. I loved it. I started when I was eight years old and I, I met the Arnies. And I was in 4-H with their kids and, and got to spend a lot of time with them. And, and, I'm, um, and Dr. Dennis and his wife, Fern, um, they've also always been there for me when I need somebody. When I was going through difficult times, you find out really who your friends are. And they're always there, very, very supportive. And, uh, and they've been some, through some very difficult times in their, their lives, but they've always been there to support me and my family. and. Um, the fact that they're here today with their daughter, Denise, who was probably the first girl ever took out on a date. It really, <laughs> really wasn't a date, but I, I took her to the Twins game. And uh, I remember we stopped at Bridgen's Ice Cream Parlor afterwards. And uh, I kept hearing about this thing called a Lollapalooza. It was this big old thing, big filled thing with ice cream. It came like in a fishbowl. Filled with whipped cream about that high, and they brought it to my table, and I started laughing so hard. I went ahead like this, and I had a big dab of whipped cream <laughs> on my forehead. And so we get home, and I drive her down her driveway, and I'm in the car, and we're chatting, and gosh, I, I wanted to kiss her so bad, but I just, 
So gosh dang nervous and um, I never did kiss her, but <laughs> anyhow, the fact that they're here, thank you guys so very much for, for coming out today. It, me it means a lot to me. And, and then, um, you know, last but not least, um, you know, when I got into running, um, <clears throat> I wasn't very good, like I said, but um, there was a kid that I became friends with right away, and he was a year in front of me. And um, you know how everybody, that old commercial, I want to be like Mike, Michael Jordan commercial, well, I wanted to be like George. Um, George Ross and his wife, or not his wife, his mom, I mean, <laughs> Carol and his sister, Susie and Charlie are here, and, and um, George was a stud. I mean, he really was. <laughs> the, the guy was, I mean, you know, if I could see his hinder for the first quarter mile in a cross country race, I was lucky, and then it was, you know, he was, he was gone. But I never forget the, George graduated, and between my junior and senior year that summer, I think George and I ran partner every day with each other. And I'd come out to their place here, and Carol just lives down the road here. And that's when, this was all out in the country. This is all gravel roads around here. And, and, and Joe, I would walk us down to the end of their lane, and he says, okay, boys, we're gonna do that, the Hamill Loop. And I think it was about eight, nine, 10 miles, something like that. It was a big loop with rolling hills. And, and he'd start the stopwatch and he'd put it in the end of the mailbox. He says, now you stop it when you get to the end here. And, and George and I, we'd start out kind of slow, but we'd be talking a little bit. But by the time we hit Hamill and start heading back, it was like uh, we were in a war against each other. And coming down Peony Lane here and past what is now the high school with a mile, mile and a half to go. And, and, um, and then the last downhill to the mailbox, I would be running as hard as I could. I never beat George, came close. He was always a step in front of me. But we'd stop that watch, and by that time, Joe would meander out, meander out there and, and um, always give us both a big hug and say, good job, boys, and that was very, very special. And then when I became a senior, even though George was no longer there, it was the first year they had girls cross country here at Wayside High School, and, and two of Joe and Carol's daughters, Charlie and Susie, who are here today, they came out for the cross country team. I don't think we had, what, five girls maybe out for the cross country team at that? It wasn't very many. And I think they let them run about a mile back then, perhaps, something like that. But um, their family was like my family. Brothers, sisters. And Joe, when I went off to college then, I went to a small little junior college and Joe would come to my meets. I, I remember going out and running quarter mile repeats out in their pasture, dodging cow pies, things like that, and <laughs> Joe would be out there with his stopwatch timing me. And, but one of my greatest memories uh, with Joe was in 1975, and I know we're getting late here, but I'll just pick this up. Um, in 1975, we had a terrible blizzard. It was like the blizzard of the century. School was called off for three, four days, and that was, you know, they didn't do that very often back then. And the school was called off. There were, I don't know how many feet of snow we got, temperatures dropped. And Joe and I, I came from where I lived on my snowmobile, and I came to Joe and Carol's place, and, and uh, the electricity, I can't remember if it was out at their place or not, but anyhow, Joe had a sister that lived out west of here, out in the country, out by Corcoran, and they had no electricity, and no nothing, so we went up to Fortin's Hardware Store up in Hamill, and we bought some canned heat and some supplies and stuff, and somehow we, we made it almost out to where their place was, but about a mile from where their home was, our snowmobiles froze up from the extreme cold and the wind, and so we had to trudge through the deep snow and the snow drifts and got to their place, and we gave them their supplies, gave them some of this canned heat, and they wanted us to stay, and Joe looked at me, and I looked at him, and neither one of us really wanted to stay. 
So we thought, well, let's, let's head for Joel and Carol's place on foot. And what was that, 10 miles, 12 miles? Something like that at least. So we started trudging out, and the blizzard was its full force, and we're trudging straight down. We finally made it to Highway 55, and we, had a, we found an a, a empty pop can on the, in the snow drift, and, and, our, and Joe and I, are, we were getting so cold, and we're, our hands were freezing, and so we would pass this can back and forth, and we were staggering going down the road and didn't know where to go. There, Highway 55, it was so blown over with snow. There was no traffic, obviously. There was nothing. And we finally get to where we thought was Highway 101, and we started north there, and we thought, well, maybe we'll, we can get to the big swamp by Elwell's farm there and cut through that. So uh, we, get, we find the big swamp, and when we got into the woods and the swamp, the snow was even deeper. And Joe started trudging through there, and, and he's beating the path, and finally he stopped. He said, Dick, I, I, he said, you got to take the lead, and I, I, and I can't go anymore. And through this deep snow. So I started forging the thing. It was snowing so hard that we got lost back in the swamp and we made this full circle back to where we were. But finally, we tried a different area and I'll never forget, we finally <laughs> knocked on the door and, and, and Carol was beside herself and Joe and I were always a little dramatic. <laughs> we walked in there and we flopped on the floor like a couple of fish being thrown up from a boat and we're rolling around you know, moaning and groaning and stuff, and it was one of the greatest times of my life, honest <laughs> to goodness. I don't know how many hours it took us to get back from there, but it, uh, it was wonderful. And, and, uh, and unfortunately, Joel, uh, Joel passed from cancer 20 years? This 20 years coming up. Coming up, yeah. It's hard to believe. 20 years coming up, and, um, and Carol has lived in the same place ever how long have you lived there now? Um, since 57. Wow, since 19, so 55 years. Wow, that's amazing. And uh, lives still out there in the woods in the cow pasture and, and, uh, and everything. But, you know, she's got incredible support from a wonderful family that she has. And I am, um, I will. For some reason, I wasn't given godparents when I, after I was baptized and stuff, but um, eventually I, I got two of the best, and Carol and Joe became my godparents. And, um, and when George and I were in high school, we made a pact with each other that whenever, when each of us got married, the other would be the best man at our weddings. And, and uh, we stuck to that pact. And, and even though George and I have lost touch over the years, um, I still think about him a lot. He's still a great inspiration for me. And um, thanks, Carol and Charlie and Susie and all the rest of the kids and to Joel and to my sister and her husband, Rick, and my other sister and all my teachers I had and the counselors I had, my wife, Jill. And you know, life, like I try to tell myself and others, is life is like a roller coaster. You can have many ups and downs. What I try to tell myself is when things are going really, really well, I try not to get too excited about it, excited about it. But even more importantly, when things are not going so well, I try not to get too down on myself. Because if you give it a chance, life will straighten itself out. And it's not always easy. And I just want to mention this to the young people that are here. I was about the most straight-laced kid you could imagine. I was never in any trouble, never did drugs, anything like that. And I became addicted to the narcotic painkillers. And it was nasty. I went doctor shopping. I stole from my dying father his pain meds. I forged my own prescriptions. I could have gone to prison. I could have lost everything that I've worked for in my life. But thankfully, I got caught. I got into treatment. And with this.
and with the support of so many people that are here today, including all the people I'd mentioned that supported me back then when I made headlines all over the United States because of the runner I once was is now caught forging prescriptions. You find out who your real friends are and your family. And my sisters and these people that I've mentioned today, they never wavered. And for that, I'll be forever grateful. And to my wife, Jill, who keeps me headed down the straight path today. And it hasn't always been easy. In the last two years, I've had two total knee replacements. And during that period of time, after surgery, I had to be on some narcotic pain medicine. But this time, there was a plan. This time, my doctors knew everything. Jill handled the medication. Could I have handled it? Perhaps, but why take that chance? So I'm very, very fortunate to have the people that I've had in my life and the people that I have in my life today. For that, I'll be forever grateful. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. God bless you. Thank you. school has initiated a Distinguished Alumni Award, and whereas recipients must have graduated a minimum of 20 years ago, and whereas recipients must have made a significant contribution to their profession, community, and or nation. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Mr. Dick Beardsley has been named the Distinguished Alumnus of the year 2011 on this 15th day of December. We hereby proclaim this as a day of special recognition for this individual whose achievements and contributions to the to or contributions merit the respect and honor to the entire community and school. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Miss I for a few closing remarks. No kidding. So this is a pass to like I can come to like football games and lifetime pass. You know, I, I gotta say one thing. When I was in high school, I, I we were kind of the laughing stock of the late conference, weren't we? I mean we got whooped on in football. The only thing we were good at at that point for the most part was like wrestling. But we had a lot of farm kids and lure boys. They were like tougher than nails. But now I keep track of why is at a high school and how you do in sports now, and you excel at everything. And I look at this campus, it's, it's like a college campus, and you're so fortunate to have a facility like this and have the support of the communities. But uh, wow, now that I got a free pass, I may have to come back to some games and <laughs> see what happens. So thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. All right, thank you very much, Dick. Um, my name is Sue Iverson, and I have the pleasure of being the student council advisor at Wyzetta High School and get to work with this awesome group of kids that um, chose you to be the award recipient this year. And um, we are going to finish now with uh, a ceremony. We have a reception that will be just down the hall, and we please welcome all of your, encourage all of your friends and family to join us down there so you'll have some, some time to speak um, with Dick personally. And um, I just wanted to say, too, uh, about the, your words that you were saying. Um, and to the kids, because now why is that it, like you said, is a very different school. We have almost 3,300 kids in this school. But I still think it's important for all of you students to understand too, just like the connection that he had to these teachers and how they're back here for him today and the other people in his lives that really support him. I hope you all feel that same connection as well. And that as, as you leave here, just know that, that those connections happen. Even though these teachers had tons of students, I've tons of students go through my life, there are those special kids that really stand out and um, will be here for you also, always. So I think that was a very good message that you passed along to our students as well, and I appreciate that. So thank you, everyone, for coming today. And please join us just down the hall, and we'll have a reception. And if any of 
Um, your family and friends would like a tour of our school. Um, the students are available to take you on the tour. We're very proud of our facility and they love to show it off, so they would love to take you around. So thank you. Thank you.